Look at verse 3, the very first phrase. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience. That word serve is an interesting one. If you go back into the original languages, the word serve can also mean worship. Serve and worship can come from the same root word. Now imagine reading this. I thank God whom I worship. I thank God whom I serve. Do you see the parallel? Service meaning that his work for God is also his worship of God. For example, I'm enjoying teaching you. I'm enjoying sharing this with you. This is my service to you. It's my service to God. But my teaching is also my worship. In our culture, we've kind of come to define worship as what we do in singing a song. So I, I like this particular musician, or I like this particular song, and so then I really worship. And it becomes all about me. But the word worship and the word serve, and there are different words for both of them, but in this particular case, service and worship have the same root meaning. I think of the verses in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 that say this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, your spiritual service. That as Christians, as followers of Christ, when we present ourselves to God for His service, that is also our worship. And you say, so what? Big deal. I know you like words, Pastor Bruce, but why are you so concerned about this one? Why are you so excited about this one? It is important. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience. It is my worship. It is my joy. It is my passion. It is my desire. In my case, to teach. In your cases, you will serve and you will uh, show hospitality. You will show leadership. You will use the gifts that God has given you. And as you serve, that becomes your worship for God and your worship of God. Well, from that phrase going forward comes the first of four times that the word remind or remember happens. He says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night. I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night. Say, Paul, as you're sitting in that prison, are you saying you pray for Timothy 24 hours a day, seven days a week? That isn't really the idea. What that really is saying is, you're on my mind so many times. And Timothy, every time that I think of you, I pray. And it has the notion that as the day passes, I can't even keep track of how many times I think about you and I remember to pray for you. But I remember you, Timothy, and I remember you before our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Example would be my children. I, I'm here in Russia teaching. I'm thousands of miles away from my children. But a number of times during the day, I think about them. And in my thoughts about them, sometimes I don't just think about them. I pray and say, Lord, it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning here in Russia. That means it's, it's um, 1 o'clock in the morning where my children are. Lord, I pray that they're sleeping. I pray that they're safe. It's not that I sit down for an hour and I plead with God for them. And there are times where I have those kinds of prayer sessions. But he's talking about all of the opportunities to pray through the given course of a day in all kinds of ways. To remember to pray. You can do the same thing. The second kind of remembering happens in verse 4. He says, As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Timothy, I miss you. When I left my children, I didn't cry, but there was deep emotion inside of me. Actually, because Trudy and I had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to the airport, we said our goodbyes to our children the night as we, we tucked them into bed. And my heart was just like, I don't want to leave my children. I love to serve in Russia. I love to teach, but I don't want to leave. And there's a, a sadness in my heart. And, and in the weeks of preparation for this trip, I was feeling guilty, like, what am I doing? Why am I sacrificing my time when I could be home with my children and the summer is warm and we could be playing in the water or working in our garden or playing baseball together? 
this, this sadness and all the memories and all the reflections. And that's what Paul is saying. I remember your tears, Timothy. I say, well, when was that? We're not exactly sure, but the, the best possibility is this. Paul, in one of his travels, had hoped to stop in the city of Ephesus late, late in his travels. And he had let the elders of the churches in Ephesus know in Acts chapter 20 that he says, I can't come to Ephesus, but I'm coming to the island of Miletus. If you'll come and join me there, then we can see each other one more time. So in Acts chapter 20, it talks about this gathering of how they gathered there on the beach and they knelt down and they prayed and they knew they were fairly certain that they would never see Paul in this lifetime again. And it says that they cried and that they wept. Timothy is not named in the scripture as having been there, but he very well could have been. I try to imagine myself as Timothy sometimes, and I wonder what it was like if I was on that beach that day on the island of Miletus, or the place of Miletus. I give my final hug to the Apostle Paul. Tears are running down my cheek. Paul walks up the, the wooden plank into the boat. I wave to him, and tears are running down my eyes, and that, that ship begins to pull away from the dock, and the sail is lifted, and the wind begins to blow, and that boat gets farther and farther and farther away. And if I'm Timothy, my heart is just breaking. I don't want to lead these churches. I don't have the strength to lead these churches. Paul, why are you leaving? It made a profound effect on the Apostle Paul that he's sitting in this prison in his own terrible conditions, and he says, Timothy, I remember your tears. I want to see you again. This is his spiritual child in the faith. And he says, Timothy, if I could, he says, I would come to see you again. And when I would see you, I would be so filled with joy. Timothy, you mean so much to me. I wonder if we show that kind of love and attention and affection for the people that God puts us in contact with. I would love to see you again. It brings me joy to be with you. One writer said it this way, where emotions are strong, tears and joy can exist side by side. I like that. Where emotions are strong, tears and joy can exist side by side. Tears and joy. That takes us to remember number three. He says in verse five, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. I remember, Timothy, you had a great foundation on which to build. Your mother, your grandmother, they really got the scriptures inside of you. You got it. And we remember from 1 Timothy and all the way back to the book of Acts that, that Timothy had a father who was Greek or was a Gentile, but his mother and his grandmother were Jewish. And they must have been believers because they poured the scriptures into Timothy. Timothy, I remember that when I met you for the first time, and we had our first conversation, you already knew so much of the scriptures. You already understood how Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. You understood a relationship with him, that you already had a deep foundation underneath you when we met, Timothy. This is phenomenal. This, this is great. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. I want to stop on that word for a minute. Sincere. That word means unhypocritical. A hypocrite who is, is a person who says one thing but does another, or who does one thing and says another. That, well, we, we say in our culture, he wears a mask. That you put this mask over your face that has a big smile on it, that has painted eyebrows, and the eyes are very happy. But behind the mask is a person who is either angry or sad or depressed. A hypocrite is someone who wears a mask. He says of Timothy, Timothy, your faith is not covered with a mask. That what you see is what you get. I, I find that so difficult as a pastor from time to time. I feel like when I'm with people, I, I, I need to put on this face or to be this kind of person that they expect. And I want to please them. I, I always want to please the people that I'm with. And so I'm tempted to say, if they say, well, Pastor Bruce, how are you doing today? I say, well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. At the same time, my day has been terrible. 
You say, well, you can't tell everybody everything, but when you're with a close friend, such as Paul and Timothy were, when someone says, Bruce, how, how was your day? And I say, you know, to be very honest with you, it's very difficult. I, I'm really struggling. Tired. This situation is difficult. These people are unhappy with me. I don't think that I preached very well. I, I'm just very discouraged. That's sincerity. Paul says to Timothy, he says, what I see in you, Timothy, is a sincerity of faith, a faith that you have had ever since your grandmother and your mother have, have put it into you. And I, I think for those of us who as, as parents, this notion of the grandmother and the mother involved in his life is so very important. The faith that our children one day have will be some kind of reflection of us as parents. I, I don't say that to make you feel guilty. I don't say that to put pressure on you. It's not an exact reflection, but it is a reflection. My faith is a reflection of my parents and my grandparents. I've had variations. I have differences. Some of the areas in which I'm deeper, they were not as deep. Some of the areas in which maybe they were deeper, I'm not. But I have a godly heritage from my grandparents and my parents that has influenced me. And our children come along and I say, I have an opportunity to have an influence on them. I'm not a perfect parent. Sometimes I don't even think I'm a very good parent. But I realize that they're watching me, they're observing me, that their views of God, their views of the scriptures come as a reflection of my faith. So it's a great encouragement and a great challenge for us when we see a verse like verse 5 to say, hey, Timothy, you've got a sincere faith, and I know where it came from. It came as you watched your mother and your grandmother as they taught you. In fact, I would say it this way. The greatest legacy that those of us who as parents will leave will be our children and not our work. Will not be our possession. It won't be our job. It won't be anything like that. That the greatest legacy that I will leave on this earth is not my ministry at Bethel Church, it's my children. I wish that I understood that more often. Because what you find as a pastor, and it doesn't matter how you serve in a church, but as a full-time uh, salaried pastor, I feel like I need to work hard. They're paying for me. They're paying me money so that I can serve them. Almost always, I will sacrifice the needs of our children for the needs of the church. But my legacy is my children, not the church first. And for those of you who get involved in ministry, maybe you become pastors, maybe you become teachers, I want you to remember that, that what you leave behind, children are like our seeds, that they get planted in the ground and they're bear, they bear fruit. And so do the people in our church. I'm not saying that the legacy in, in, in the church at Bethel is not important. It is. But my children and my children's faith, because they will marry and they will have children and their children will have children, that becomes a legacy. So very important. So let's do what we can to share the faith that we have with them. Now there's one more thing that he is reminded of. He says this. Um, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. So he's given him these things that he, is, that he is reminded of Timothy about, and now he turns it around in verses 6 and 7 to say, now here's what I want to remind you of. Timothy, there are some things that I need you to remember. I remember a variety of things about you. Now, I want you to remember these things. And so he says this, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Remember his gift? His gift is that of a teacher. Timothy, don't neglect this gift. Remember how I said, use it or lose it? Timothy, I know you don't feel well. I know you're tired. I know you're depressed. But fan it into flame. So I want you to imagine a campfire. There are camps going on around in different church camps right now. Imagine that you're there with one of them, and there's all these children, and you've built a big fire. And you've been playing, and you've enjoyed it, and you've been singing songs, and, and you've been having little snacks, and, and you've had a great time. But you kind of forget about the fire for a while, and after a couple of hours, the fire begins to burn down. And the logs begin to turn to ashes, and, and all of a sudden somebody notices, hey, the fire is going out, so what do you do? You go over and you maybe take some more wood or some small sticks 
or some kindling wood, and you lay it on there very carefully because you don't want the fire to go out. And, and I've done this myself. You get real close and you start blowing the And you blow real soft at first. You just go. And you watch those red embers begin to, to flame up a little bit. And, and a little bit of fire catches on some of that small kindling wood or the pieces of paper. And so you blow a little bit harder. You go. And you blow a little harder. And pretty soon you have a fire growing again. And all of a sudden this fire that had almost gone out because of the new fuel that you've added to the fire begins to make a big fire again. That's what he's telling Timothy. Hey, Timothy. Use your gift. Teach. You're good at explaining things. You're good at the details. You're good at things that I'm not good at, Timothy. Blow on it. Fan it into flame so that 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 flame gets bigger and bigger again, and use, use the gifts that God has given you in the way that he has blessed you to do. And you say, well, I don't know what my gift is. We talked about that a little bit in our study in 1 Timothy. You say, there's all kinds of ways to find out what our spiritual gift is. Sometimes we just tell people, try something, try anything. Try teaching, try working with little children, try working with teenagers, try service things or hospitality things or leadership things, but just try it. And when you find out what God has gifted you to do, you say, well, I just, I need to fan that into flame. I want to use it. I want to be around people who can encourage me and train me. One of the things that we've done with our children is we've just asked them to try lots of things. Both my wife and I were basketball players in high school, and then I played basketball in college as well. And so as our children have come along, Trudy and I both agreed our children don't have to play the same sports that we did. It's okay with us. They can find new sports. So ever since they were little children, we said to them, just try whatever seems interesting to you in sports. So they've, they've played soccer. They've played basketball. The boys have played American football. Michaela has played some volleyball. In music, Michaela plays the violin. She plays the piano. Chandler plays the violin. Landon plays the guitar. Landon plays the drums. Sasha's still young enough. She She's still figuring out what she's interested in. She'll play at the piano and just kind of make noise. But what we've done with our children is hey, just try something. By the time you get into the high school years, and certainly the university years, you won't be able to do them all. You're not even going to be good at all of them. You might be good at one thing. Our son Landon, he's the most unique of our children in that he is the least, um, um, he is the least like everybody else. He is his own pattern. And so when it comes to sports and activities, he doesn't fit into a certain mold. And so when it comes to athletic events, we say, I don't know what Landon's good at. He, he plays basketball, but he doesn't enjoy it. He plays football, but he's not particularly good at it. Well, this spring, he was in seventh grade, and he had a, the first opportunity to be in track, track and field, running events. And we had done some running before. Our family had run in a, a five-kilometer race. And, and we had noticed that he has a very good stride and that he runs very well. And he ran, two years ago in fifth grade, he ran five kilometers faster than I did. So, wow, I think maybe you're a good runner. So this year, he's in seventh grade. It's the first year that he can be in track. So Landon, you want to try it? Yeah, Dad, I want to try it. So he... He gets into track, and he tries a different, in his very first track meet, he runs the 1,600-kilometer race. And we're like, oh, I wonder how he's going to do. And it was in a different town, so when he, when he came back or when he called us, how'd you do, Landon? He says, well, I did pretty well. He says, I set the record for the seventh graders in our school. You what? <laughs> and the second time he ran, he improved on his record by 30 seconds. Well, Landon... You have found something that you're really good at. Well, okay, maybe I'm good at it. It's the same way with spiritual gifts. Try anything. Try everything and find out what God does in you. And you say, I love to do that. I say, I, I was born to teach. God made me a teacher. You don't have to be a teacher. You can do any kind, lots of different things. Just get involved. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. 
You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Now verse 7 is something else he said, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Timothy, you've been afraid for too long. That's not what God intends for you. He didn't give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a spirit of power. He, he gave you a spirit of love. He gave you a spirit of self-control. The, the, the word for fear means cowardly. It means a shameful fear that comes from a shameful, weak character. That's not what the Christian is supposed to be like. We are not supposed to be cowards with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do not have weak characters. We have a strong character in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And he says, this is what he's given you. He's given you a, a spirit of power. The word for power means God-given abilities to overcome obstacles. It's ability. He says, I've given you the spirit of love, which we've talked about love being self-sacrificing. It's always looking to the other person's needs. That's the, the power of Jesus Christ in you, Timothy. He's given you the power of self-control, sound judgment, sensible behavior, acting in light of who we are in Jesus Christ. It's as if God says to the Christian, he says, I didn't save you so that you could go back to the way you were. I saved you so that you could become like I am that you could be a follower of me, that you could imitate me, that you could live in my power and you could be transformed in relationship with me, my life, my hope, my strength, my power. I come back into the world in which you and I live. It's an uncertain time and it's an uncertain world. Things happening in your country, things happening in my country, things happening in countries all over the world. There are all kinds of opportunities for, for us to be afraid these days. There are times when I'm afraid for my country and the things that are happening in our country. We, our country seems to be going faster and faster away from God. That, that our country was built on some very sound Christian principles and our country is just going off in a path away from God faster and faster and I could have reason to be afraid. In whatever country that you are listening to these words, you might have the same fears for your country. Say, my country is like this. My community is in bad shape. My, my school is in, in a difficult situation. My family is dysfunctional. And so many things the enemy uses against us that causes us to fear. And Paul would say to you, you have no reason to fear because we serve a powerful God. We serve a sovereign God who is always in control. God puts rulers in place for a certain time and a certain season. God put you here in this world at this time for a certain reason. I could have been born hundreds of years ago in God's wisdom. But God says, I'm going to create Bruce. I'm going to put him in the 20th and the 21st century. I'm going to give him opportunities that as a little boy, he couldn't even have imagined. But that he is going to go travel to a foreign country, in, in, into a place called Russia, and he's going to teach. I couldn't even imagine it. God says, I will blow you away with how great and how powerful and awesome I am. In these times, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have no reason to fear. No reason to fear whatsoever. We have the same thing that Paul, you have the spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The question is, do you have a relationship with this God? Do you know him? Have you said, Lord, I believe that you exist. I believe you died for my sins. I believe that you can transform my life. Do you have that? If you have that, then you have the opportunities to know what Paul talks about, a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com